I'm happy to say this is Dr. Cecilia Zumajo. Uh, she has just successfully defended her dissertation. Uh, and uh, I, I've had the pleasure of, of uh, hearing her defense talk and, and uh, it's gonna be really interesting to hear um, sort of a more, a more broad or, or simplified uh, discussion about some of these very complex topics. I'm very excited myself. Um, so Cecilia is uh, a now perhaps a former grad student at uh, the City University of New York and the New York Botanical Garden um, and uh, working with, with uh, uh, Barbara Ambrose. And uh, so uh, when you're ready, Cecilia, you are free to take over. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to start sharing my screen. All right. So we're all seeing my screen, right? Just making sure, Jordan. Yes, I can see your screen. Okay. Yep, I see it. Oh, Thank okay. you very much. I'm sorry, one, one last thing about questions. Uh, so if you have questions, you feel free to, uh, to write them in the chat throughout. At the end of, of, uh, of Cecilia's talk, we're going to, uh, we're going to field questions from the chat and I will read them aloud to Cecilia. Uh, for her to answer. So, uh, okay. okay. So with that, have at it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. So today we're going to talk about SAIDs. Um, so to approach the understanding of the evolution of this very enigmatic structure, which is the SAID, rich in morphologies, as you can see in this uh, slide, it is necessary to get an insight into the genes that are involved in its development. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So the seed constitutes a turning point in the evolution of land plants, and it's an important synapomorphy of all seed plants. So today I'm going to share with you the results of uh, the work that we have been doing on four different species of gymnosperms. So the first lineages where seeds evolved, uh, Ginkgo biloba, Nerum nemon, Ephedra californica, and Ephedra antisyphilitica. All right, so uh, let's imagine for a moment a world without seeds. That is a little difficult for us because we're completely immersed in a world of seeds from the morning coffee and bagels to the cotton in our clothes to uh, the late uh, night cocoa, uh, we live in a world of it. So it's a little difficult to imagine a world without that. So for that, we would have to go back around 400 million years to the early Devonian when Earth was extremely humid still, and it was colonized by ferns and lycophytes. Lycophytes are like club mosses. And uh, so this is in the early Devonian. And we're going to stay here in the early De Devonian for a little while because many innovations took place during the uh, Devonian explosion. So here we have a representation of the landscape during that time period. And we already have vascular plants here. So another innovation took place during, during this time, and that is heterospory. Heterospory is the production of two different kinds of spores. So now these some plants are able to make a microspores, which will give rise to the, to the male gametes, and a megaspores, which uh, now give rise uh, to the female gametes. So we see that in lycophytes, like club mosses, we, which we have here represented. And it turns out that uh, in lycophytes, actually during this period, there was like an enormous diversity of lycophytes and there were these amazing giant lycophytes that don't exist nowadays. In fact, nowadays all lycophytes are very small in size, but at the time there were these giant trees that had like, they were tall up to 30 meters tall. So they were really big trees. And uh, this is a Lepidodendron, and another genus in this uh, lineage of Lepidodendrales is Lepidocarpon. So Lepidocarpon is uh, also extinct, and they had these uh, structures that resemble a lot uh, a seed. So they're functionally 
convergent with a seed, but they are not seeds. They are characterized, they have this megagametophyte completely surrounded by this protective structure, which is the seed coat. The difference now is that this structure dehisces, so it releases the female gametes, making them more accessible for the male gametes, right? So that's the main difference with the, the seed that we see nowadays. So heterospory is a, a characteristic that evolved multiple times during the evolution of land plants. And we see it nowadays in lycophytes and in aquatic ferns, right? But they were a, this characteristic was later retained by all seed plants. So all uh, plants uh, after when seed plants evolved, they are all now heterosporous. They all have two different kinds of spores. The first lineages of a plants where a seeds or a structure similar to a seed started to evolve uh, the, uh, are these also fossil lineages that have these pre-ovule uh, structures where we have a mega gametophyte or a female gametophyte covered by these integumentary lobes that uh, vary in the degree of fusion. So those integumentary lobes in the different genera are going to have different degrees of fusion, right? So this is known as a pre-ovule. So if we take a closer look at those seedless plants and the reproductive structures, it is possible to start seeing uh, some of the key characteristics that were necessary for the evolution of the seed. So we already talked about heterospory, but there is also endosporic development, which is the development inside the, the, of the gametophyte inside that spore, right? and also the integument, the evolution of the integument or the seed coat. And the integument constitutes the key novelty in the evolution of the seed because it ensures a protection of the embryo for very long periods of time and also tolerance to desiccation. <clears throat> so that's why we're going to actually focus on the evolution of the integument and in fact of the, of the seed itself. So, it turns out that we still don't understand and we don't know how the integument evolved, how it appeared, but there are, of course, some hypotheses trying to explain uh, uh, this uh, evolution of the seed. So, <clears throat> based on the aerial in Taxus, uh, the de novo hypothesis suggests that the integument evolved as a completely new structure. So, this is a de novo origin hypothesis based on the fossil record that I, sh I show you a, a little a while ago uh, is the uh, telom origin hypothesis which suggests that uh, the integument is the result of the fusion of those integumentary lobes or those telomes right forming the, the integument or there is a third hypothesis uh, which is based uh, mainly in uh, the fern lineages and also in the pollen cones of cycads, uh, which suggest that the integument is the result of esterilization and fusion of sporangia around a single fertile uh, sporangium. So it turns out that the fossil record may also support this synangial hypothesis because <clears throat> it is possible that those telomes or those integumentary lobes were at some point fertile. So these two hypotheses are not necessarily mutually exclusive, right? So what is a seed? Here on the right, we have an example of a seed of a phedra. And if we make a cut of, that, of one of those seeds longitudinally, we would see the three main tissues that form a seed, which is the embryo, the nutritive tissue, which is going to nourish that embryo, and a protective layer, which is the seed coat. But the seed is just at the mature stage of the ovule. When the ovule gets fertilized, it becomes the seed. And we, here we have on the left a corresponding picture of a, the ovule. And again, if we make a longitudinal section through one of those ovules, we would see the megasporangium covered by the integument. After fertilization, the integument will undergo a series of changes and ontogenetic transformations becoming the seed coat. So the ovule is defined as a megasporangium 
covered by the integument. So since the ovule evolved around 300 million years ago, it became the most salient feature of all seed plants. But there are still major uh, and striking morphological differences between the major seed plant lineages. For instance, in gymnosperms, or most gymnosperms, are characterized by having only one integument covering that megasporangium. The integument will leave this small opening known as the micropyle, and that opening is going to allow the pollen to enter and fertilize the egg. So in most gymnosperms, there is a, this opening is located opposite to the stalk of the ovule. Whereas in most angiosperms, there are two integuments, and the outer integument shows asymmetric growth, making the ovule to bend on itself and leaving the micropyle located next to the stalk right, of the ovule. But these are the major uh, morpho morphologies for these uh, lineages, but there are still a lot of, there is a still a lot of variation in the ovules within each uh, clade. So for instance, in gymnosperms, there are many uh, different associated structures that may also cover those ovules. And in fact, in, in Natalis, there are these uh, extra structures uh, covering the ovules that uh, some people also interpret as extra integuments. So for these structures, the homology is uh, still unclear. We still, uh, there are several different hypotheses uh, about the homology of these extra structures surrounding the ovules in gymnosperms. All right. So, Behind all uh, that uh, diversity of ovules, of course, there are some genes that are involved in the development of those uh, structures. So as in any genetic uh, studies, um, there is always a mole species. So for studies in animals, uh, the mole species is usually um, a mouse. But in uh, plants, the mole species is Arabidopsis thaliana, which belongs to the Brassicaceae family, so the mustard family. And this is a picture of those ovules in the mole species Arabidopsis. And next to it is a drawing of one of those ovules, uh, well-developed ovules, which I am going to use to illustrate where each of the different genes has a function, right? So for instance, integumenta is a gene that is involved in the proper development of both integuments. So we see integumenta here in green. At the bottom here, we have the mutant. So how does the ovule look like when that gene is not present? If we remove that gene, this is what happened with those uh, ovules. They do not develop integuments, right? Bell is a gene that is also involved in the proper development of both integuments, and the mutant doesn't have integuments. Instead, it has a fleshy structure at the base of the ovules that resembles a bell. Uh, then we have inner no outer. Inner no outer is a gene that is a specific to the outer integument. The mutant only has one inner integument. Aberrant testa shape is a gene that is involved in the proper separation of both integuments. So the mutant has only one fused integument. So once the integuments are initiated, they now have to grow covering that enocellus or that metamidophyte. And there are, of course, also genes involved in this process, and many different genes, uh, which include short integuments one, which is involved in the proper elongation of both integuments, and unicorn, which is a gene that is involved in the uh, cell growth of the outer integument, and the mutant uh, has this overgrowth uh, coming out of the outer integument. So we know all of this for the mole species, Arabidopsis, uh, but the story gets a little bit more complicated because these genes do not belong to the same gene family, they all belong to a different uh, gene family. So now the story is getting a little bit more complex. So we know, uh, as I mentioned before, we know this for the mole species, Arabidopsis thaliana. These are the seeds here. Arabidopsis evolved around 6 million years ago. So now 
we have we started this project with three main questions the first one is what are these genes doing in an ovule that has a completely uh, different morphology and that evolved much earlier in an evolutionary time like the ovules in gymnosperms and also we wanted to know if uh, by understanding this molecular uh, and now by doing this molecular analysis and understanding the development of the ovules in gymnosperms if we could uh, better interpret uh, these structures these accessory structures that we find in several different uh, lineages of gymnosperms like in Nitalis and also uh, we wanted to know if we could if we could gather a molecular evidence that could help us refine or select a, or, or provide evidence for one of those hypotheses that I mentioned before about the uh, origin of the seed. So to do this, the first thing that we had to do is we had to look for those genes in gymnosperms because we didn't know if these genes were even present in gymnosperms. So, we knew from uh, previous studies that inner no outer is not present in gymnosperms so it's only present in flowering plants but uh, we had to look for all the other genes and that's what i did first so i used the the sequence from arabidopsis from the model species as query to find sequences across all seed plants using a different genome and transcriptome databases available I downloaded all of those sequences, I put them together, and I built uh, these maximum likelihood topologies. So these are analyses to understand the evolutionary history of these uh, gene lineages. I had between 100 and 800 sequences for each of these genes at the end. So I know it's going to be very difficult uh, to see what's actually happening in this uh, gene trace. So each of these is a, a, the, the evolution of a, each a gene lineage. So I'm going to summarize it with these triangles, right? So in purple, we have the angiosperm clades, and in blue are the gymnosperm clades. The yellow stars are pointing to places where we identified duplication events for these lineages. So for instance, the Aintegumenta gene lineage has undergone three different duplication events, angiosperm specific, right? So if we look at each of these genes uh, and each of these gene lineages, we see uh, several independent duplication events, and many of those are gymnosperm specific. But uh, it turns out that short integuments one is highly conserved across all seed plants. It hasn't undergone a single duplication event. So we did this because we needed to understand the evolution of uh, the gene the gene lineages that we're working with because genes evolved uh, not necessarily in the same way that a species evolved and that's why we have to build those and that's actually why we see several duplication events so for instance this uh, lineage uh, angiosperms here have two copies of this gene right so many things can happen when a gene duplicates uh, here I'm illustrating with this a uh, multipurpose camping tool a single gene a single copy ancestral gene so when this gene duplicates one a scenario is that the two new copies so these are the two new copies retain the exact same functions right so if you see they have the exact same functions so now these two new copies are redundant Another possible scenario is that uh, the ancestral functions are distributed between the two new copies, as you can see here. This is known as subfunctionalization. Another possible scenario is that a new one of the new copies retains all the exact same functions and the other uh, copy acquires completely new functions, right? So this is known as neo-functionalization. So if we go back to our uh, representation and the evolutionary history of these genes and uh, to all the multiple independent duplication events that we identified, it is very difficult to extrapolate what we know from one species to uh, all the others. In fact, uh, 
Arabidopsis would be here. So for instance, this is a duplication as specific to Brassicaceae. So it's very difficult to extrapolate what we know from the model species to all the others because actually the number of genes is changing for it in a different way for each of these gene lineages. So now we wanted to know what is the role of these genes in gymnosperms. So to answer this question, we uh, work with two different species of gymnosperms, ginkgo and nirum nimon. So uh, we collected ovules and seeds uh, throughout their development in order to understand the morphology and anatomy of these structures and better describe them. But uh, we were also able to perform an expression study. So when you want to know, and that's the experiment I'm conducting here on this video. So when you want to know the function of a gene, what you do is that you usually do is that you remove that gene from the plant and you see what happens when that gene is not present, right? So that's a functional characterization of the gene. But sometimes that's not possible. For instance, in gymnosperms that are very big trees, they have very long life cycles. So you're not actually able to grow these plants in the lab. So those studies are not possible. So being able to perform this expression analysis was very important for us. This is known as in situ hybridization. And this technique allows us to make hypotheses on the function of those genes because it shows us where is like that gene is expressed exactly when and where that gene is expressed. So for instance here we have a section of a, a, an ovule in ginkgo and in purple we see the expression of that gene at that specific time in development. All right, so if we take a closer look at the morphology and anatomy here, we're seeing the sections, the anatomical sections of uh, different stages of uh, ginkgo ovule development. And I want to highlight four different stages here. So a uh, stage one is when the integument starts developing from the sides of the nocellus, right? So this would be the integument then that integument is going to grow and overtop the nocellus. And by stage four, there are three different regions that can be differentiated in the integument of ginkgo. The endotesta, the sclerotesta, and the sarcotesta. The sarcotesta is the outermost layer of the integument and is the one that becomes fleshy and gives that fleshy uh, characteristic uh, to the ginkgo seeds. It is rich in tannins as well as in mucilage uh, cavities. So, and uh, then by a stage eight, the seed has fallen off the tree uh, through two possible abscission zones, one at the base of the funiculus and the other one at the base uh, of the ovule. And that's what you see here stained with red. That's the abscission zone at the base of the ovule. There is another characteristic that I really want to highlight uh, from uh, ginkgo and most gymnosperms as well, and is that uh, the integument and the nocellus are completely fused to each other at the base of the ovule, and they only become free in the apical portion of the ovule. So that region where you cannot really differentiate between the integument and the nocellus is known as the pachychalaza, and this happens in many uh, gymnosperm ovules. All right, so, for a uh, needle, the story is a uh, very different. The uh, ovules in needle are, are very unique. They have a very unique morphology. They can grow on this uh, strobili that can be unisexual or they can be bisexual, as you can see here on the first picture uh, at the top. So here we have the ovules growing on top of the pollen cones or the microsporangia, and they grow from the same node, right? So uh, the first section here at the bottom would be a section through one of those bisexual cones where we have here the ovule on top of the pollen cones. And here we see the pollen grains that are viable. So the ovule on that same node is not viable. 
There is another key characteristic, and is that the ovules in needum are surrounded by extra structures. So the ovules have a, an inner a layer, which is the integument, which is going to form the micropyle. And then there are two extra envelopes surrounding that ovule, right? But when the ovule grows on a bisexual cone, there are only two envelopes. So we have the inner one, which is the integument and forms the micropyle, and one extra envelope. So here the ovule is viable, so the pollen cones next to it are not viable. All right, so Let's now take a look at the expression patterns of uh, those uh, genes that I mentioned at the beginning of uh, the talk and in these two different species. I know these are many genes, so I'm going to leave here at the top left corner the expression patterns of those genes in Arabidopsis, the model species, at two different ovular stages. So here, for instance, whose shell is expressed in the nucellus of that ovule in Arabidopsis. But if we take a closer look at the expression of a, in ginkgo, this, uh, we were able to perform this study in different stages of the ovule and the seed, as well as in the pollen cones and in the leaves. So if we take a look at the expression of wood shell in ginkgo, and that's what we see in purple here, we see that a wood shell is expressed throughout the ovule, and it's also found in the pollen cones and in the leaves. Integumenta in ginkgo is expressed at the base of the ovule. So this uh, cell layer over here that we see st stained with purple or with purple, that shows the expression of integumenta. And it, that region corresponds to the abscission zone of, of the seed later in the development. Then we see expression also in the pollen chamber. The pollen chamber is the apical region of the nucellus, which is going to receive the pollen, and also in the megaspore mother cell. Uh, we see expression again in the pollen grains and in the leaves. The expression of integumenta in needle is in the nucellus and in the integument as well. Bell one. Bell 1 in ginkgo has a very similar expression pattern to what we saw earlier for integumenta. It's also found in those cell layers that are going to form the abscission zone later uh, in seed development. We also saw expression in the apical region of the nucellus and in the megaspore molar cell. For needle, uh, we saw expression in the nucellus, right? So canari, canari is a gene that is involved in the a planar identity, so that flat identity of the integuments in a Arabidopsis. But in ginkgo, we saw expression in the nucellus, and later in the ovule development, we saw expression throughout the ovule. Then it's also expressed in the pollen cones and in the leaves. For needle, there are two copies of canary genes. Um, it is expressed in venocellus as well as in the integument. And we saw expression also in the megaspore molar cell. The other copy has a completely different expression pattern. And uh, we saw it in the megaspore molar cell and in the integument. Unicorn uh, is a gene that is expressed in the apical region of the very young integuments in ginkgo and in the pollen grains. For needle, there are also two copies with different expression patterns. One of those uh, genes, one of those unicorn genes is expressed in the nucellus, and the other one is restricted only to the megaspore molar cell and to the apical region of the integument. All right, so from this part, we can make uh, five different conclusions, right? So the first one is based on the evolutionary history of those genes. And uh, we saw that there are different uh, duplication events, independent duplication events. So the evolutionary history of these genes is very complex uh, and they all have undergone independent duplication events. We also, uh, here we have uh, the summarized expression patterns. So for Arabidopsis, this is a drawing of the strobilus in needle with the pollen cones here at the base and the ovule on top. 
And then this is the expression in two different ovular stages in ginkgo, and this is the drawing of a pollen cone in ginkgo. So if we take a quick glimpse at the expression patterns that we saw for each of these genes in these different species, it's possible to conclude that they are not conserved, the function is not conserved across all seed plants because we didn't see expression for many of these genes in the integument uh, of these uh, gymnosperma species. But it's also important to highlight that these are a very different uh, species uh, morphologically, right? So it's very difficult uh, to understand the expression patterns with these major morphological differences. And it's possible that we're seeing uh, changes in the expression patterns because of that. So it turns out that in Arabidopsis, this is a drawing of the very young ovules in Arabidopsis, we have three different regions in the proximal distal axis of the ovules. So we have the funiculus, which is going to hold the ovule. Then we have a chalazal region, which is the region that gives rise to the integuments. And then there is the nocellus at the distal or the apical region of those ovules. And in Arabidopsis, Wuschel is expressed only in the nocellus, and Wuschel is a meristematic gene, so it has meristematic activity. And it turns out that the function of Bell in integument development, it's because it represses Wuschel towards the nocellus. So it maintains the boundary between the nocellus and the chalazal uh, region of the, of the ovule. And the maintenance of that boundary is very important for the proper development of the integument. But it turns out that then we have a gymnosperms, where we have this region where we cannot really differentiate between the integument and the nocellus. And in fact, we saw expression of Wuschel throughout that region, and that's where I'm a drawing here, representing here with this pink, and that the, that's the expression of Wuschel. So this suggests that this region is, it has also meristematic activity. And if we take a closer look at the expression patterns of Bell, it's possible to see that the, the function of these genes may be also conserved, but uh, we're seeing major differences in their expression because of the major morphological differences between uh, the ovules in these two species. All right. Another very key conclusion that we were able to make is based on the expression patterns that we saw for all of these genes in the megagametophytes, so in the sporangia. And uh, we saw expression of in all of those for all of those genes in that region, suggesting that the integument genes were co-opted from the sporangia developmental network. But this is something that must have happened much earlier in an evolutionary time. And it turns out that some of these genes have also been studied in seedless plants like a uh, Fiscomitrella, mosses, lycophytes, and ferns, and they have also been found in the sporangia in those uh, uh, species. So that co-option happened much earlier, and this also allows us to uh, suggest that the integuments are the result of esterilization of sporangia, as the synangial hypothesis is suggested. This is a very exciting conclusion. All right, another conclusion is that it's completely based on needle. And uh, we did see expression of some of those genes in the integument in needle, but we never saw expression in the outer envelopes, in those extra structures that surround the ovules in needle. So there is this ongoing debate on whether or not these structures are integuments. And recently, many uh, morphological and anatomical studies have suggested that they are non integuments, and that's why we call them envelopes. And our expression studies, as we didn't see expression of the integument genes in these structures, also suggest that these are non integuments. However, I really want to highlight here that because we saw that the evolutionary history of these genes is very complex, it is very difficult to 
uh, make homology conclusions based on the expression uh, patterns of these genes. So I definitely think that we need more studies to make better conclusions on the identity of those extra structures in mutates. All right, so now we wanted to know if we could identify other different uh, genes uh, involved in seed development that we were not getting from the mole species Arabidopsis. So to do that, uh, we sequence uh, the transcriptome of a different species. So here I'm going to show you uh, the results that we obtained for the sequencing of uh, the integument in ginkgo. So what I did here is that I dissected different tissues from ginkgo, the young ovules, the integuments, the megagametophyte, the collar, which is a structure unique to ginkgo. It's vegetative. Uh, we also uh, sequenced the pollen cones and the leaves, right? So these, uh, all these different tissues were dissected. So it turns out that um, we are interested, particularly interested in the RNA, so that's why we did transcriptome analysis, because the RNA is the part of a, is the part that is going to codify, it's going to be a, a traduced a, to protein, so it's the functional part. So we sequenced that and uh, we uh, extracted the RNA from uh, these uh, different structures. And then what it comes from here on, it's all bioinformatic, as exciting as uh, uh, all the bioinformatic analysis are as exciting as you can see here, uh, Seinfeld. <laughs> all right. So it turns out that uh, to have a, a, an overview of the samples, um, and how uh, they uh, are structures or the similarities and differences between the, the genes that are expressed in the different tissues that we dissected. I performed this principal component analysis, which allows us to see the differences between samples. So it turns out that here we were able to identify that the megagametophyte and the integument are kind of like the most dissimilar samples. And this was corroborated with hierarchical clustering. So these, with this dendrogram, we're actually able to see better the similarities between the different samples. So we identified that the integument and the megagametophyte are more similar, forming one cluster here in blue. And all the other samples are in another cluster here represented in green. So the first thing that I did when I sequenced that a that transcriptome and I obtain uh, the results from the transcriptome uh, is that I look for those candidate genes that I mentioned before. I look for those sequences and I look for the expression levels and I built uh, this heat map that you're seeing here. So in dark, in dark uh, blue, we see upregulated genes and in yellowish, we see the genes that are downregulated. So if we take a look at the expression levels of these genes, we actually don't see major differences. They, are all, they all seem uh, like very similarly expressed with the difference of uh, this integumenta, which seems to be down-regulated in the integument, right? But we have to filter the data to obtain only the genes that have a statistical significance and that are a uh, that actually show a larger change in the expression level. So this was done before any of those filtering steps. After filtering the data, these uh, genes were not retained. So suggesting and corroborating our previous findings that these genes are not differentially expressed in the integument of ginkgo. So here on the right, we have a, a cluster map. Um, showing the genes that we identified that are actually differentially expressed. So I identified two, over 2,000 genes differentially expressed. And again, here you see in blue are upregulated genes and in yellowish are downregulated genes. 
So these are a lot of genes. There are over 2,000 genes. So what I did is that I looked for the function of the possible function of these genes, and I decided to focus my attention only on transcription factors. So it turns out that a transcription factors have a DNA binding activity and they are very well known to be involved in different developmental processes in, in plant, during plant development. So that's why I focus on transcription factors. So from those over 2000 genes, 134 are transcription factors. And this is what we're seeing here in this cluster map. So here we have several different well-known transcription factor families like TCPs, a petala twos, and all of these genes definitely deserve uh, to be further characterized to know their function in integument development in ginkgo. But there was one that really, really caught my attention, and that is Fantastic Four Three. Uh, isn't that a very cool name for a gene? So it turns out that Fantastic Four uh, represses Wuzschel. So I don't know if you remember Wuzschel from the expression patterns that I show you uh, before. Wuzschel is a gene that is involved in the meristematic uh, activity. So it's involved in meristem development. And that's what we're seeing here. Wuzschel is expressed in the shoot apical meristem here of Arabidopsis. And it turns out that, well, there are four fantastic four genes in Arabidopsis, of course. And uh, what they did is that they overexpressed these fantastic four genes and they saw repression of the expression of Wuzschel. So that suggests that fantastic four represses Wuzschel. So that's all what we know about fantastic four genes so far. So the first thing that I had to do is that I had to know if this copy that we were obtaining here in this analysis was an actual homologue of the fantastic four genes. So to know that, again, I built a maximum likelihood topology to see the evolution of that gene lineage. And it turns out that yes, that copy is actually a fantastic four homolog. But I was also able to identify several duplication events for this gene lineage as well. And so in a, a here we have in dark purple all the angiosperms, so all the flowering plants uh, genes. And I was able to identify that the four copies in Arabidopsis are the result of duplication events that are specific to that family, specific to the Brassicaceae family. And there was another duplication event before angiosperm diversification. So it turns out that all gymnosperm genes are pre-duplication genes, are pre-duplication homologs. So I still uh, did the expression patterns uh, for ginkgo, and it turns out that I found, so on the top we have the expression in the ovules, and we see here the expression in purple only in the outermost uh, region, and we don't see expression in the inner side. So inside this red circle, we have the nosalus. We don't see expression in, uh, of that gene there. It's specific to the integument because we don't see expression in the pollen cone or in the leaf. So this is very exciting as well. So from this part, now we able to make two major conclusions. The first one is that we were able to corroborate that uh, those candidate genes are in fact not uh, differentially expressed in the integument, suggesting that they are not uh, involved in integument development in ginkgo. But we were also able to identify other uh, genes that may be actually involved in the integument in ginkgo that we didn't know uh, from the mole species Arabidopsis because here we have the expression browser of one of those uh, fantastic fours in Arabidopsis and we see that it's highly expressed in the shoot apical meristem because it represses Wuzschel in that uh, meristematic region. But we didn't know about this gene uh, from a uh, seed expression in uh, Arabidopsis. But if we take a look at the expression patterns of these genes in ginkgo, they overlap in the integument. So this suggests that they may be also interacting and
and they may be involved in integumin development in Ginkgo. All right, so now, as I show you at the beginning of this talk, there is an enormous diversity of seed code structures and different seed code morphologies. So we wanted to know if we could see a if we could identify other genes involved in different seed code structures. So to answer this question, uh, we focus on a genus which is perfect to answer this question, and that is ephedra, also from Natalis. And I say that it's perfect because it shows different morphologies in the, in the ovules. So I was able to collect the young cones the uh, shoots, the pollen cones, and uh, the ovules, as well as the bracts, completely dissected. So these are the tissues that I dissected. So I focus on Ephedra californica and Ephedra antisyphilitica. This is from California, and this is from Texas. And here we have the representation of those extra structures, which uh, are here uh, labeled as bracts, right? So these structures cover the ovule. And uh, in Ephedra californica, these extra structures or these bracts remain completely dry, uh, covering the ovule. Whereas in other species, like in Ephedra antisyphilitica, these bracts become uh, fleshy surrounding the ovule, which is really, really cool and really exciting. So that's why it was a really key lineage uh, to answer this question about the genes that may be involved in different seed coat morphologies. So again, I did the same thing uh, to understand the structure of the data set. I did a principal component analysis. So for a, a federal Californica, I was able to identify that the ovule, the shoot, and the pollen corner at the most kind of like the similar samples. And all the and they are in fact in one cluster, so they are more similar to each other. And bracts and young cones are in another cluster. There is a different pattern uh, happening for a Fedra antisyphilitica, and here the ovule is the most dissimilar sam sample, and in fact, it's in its own cluster here in blue. And all the other samples are very similar to each other in another cluster. So again, I did this analysis of uh, the differential expression of the genes uh, for uh, this seed code structure, and that's what we're seeing here on the left. This is the cluster map, and again, in blue are upregulated genes, and in yellow are downregulated genes. So for a federal Californica, I identified 407 differential expressed genes, which is what we're seeing here. From those 23 are transcription factors. Again, I was able to identify several well-known transcription factor families, very large families. But there is something else that I really want to highlight. And is that when I collected this tissue, I collected the entire cone, including ovules and bracts in like young in the developmental stage. And then I dissected the older bracts. So if we make a comparison between the genes that are in a share between these two samples, the young cones and uh, the older brats, we see uh, some genes that are shared. So those genes may be involved throughout a BRAC development. So I was able to identify 26 shared genes. And from those are some genes that are very well known to be involved in ovule development, like AGL6. All right, so in a Fedra antisyphilitica, uh, I did the same thing and I identified 524 differential express genes from those 34 transcription factors. And um, this is something really cool. I did the same analysis, uh, share, uh, identifying the genes that are shared between the two samples, the young cones and the bracts. And I identified several genes, 48 genes, including a ethylene responsive transcription factors. These genes are very well known to, uh, for being involved in fruit uh, ripening. So these are ethylene responsive uh, transcription factors. And another Matzbox gene uh, called TT16 that is also involved in fruit ripening in angiosperms. So that was very cool because this is a species that uh, becomes fleshy, 
All right, so from this part, we have like three main conclusions. The first one is that we saw major differences in the genes that are expressed between these two species, and that makes sense because these species are very different morphologically. I was also able to identify new genes that may be involved in the development of these uh, seed codes. And also, Ephedra is a genus that has been proposed multiple times as a possible a model species for genetic studies in gymnosperms. So uh, because it has a very a relatively fast life cycle and is very small in size, uh, so it, it's a really good uh, candidate for a model species. So now that we've uh, made this transcriptome analysis, uh, we're able to better establish a uh, ephedra as a possible model species as a, we're providing more data for these species. All right, so from this work, uh, we can make several conclusions. I don't know why I'm seeing some like lines. Anyways, uh, so from uh, this entire work, we can make several conclusions. And the first one, I don't know if you can see these blue lines, Anyways, so it turns out that a, the, it's most likely that the genetic network as we know it is not conserved across all seed plants. So there are major changes in the genes that are involved in the development of the seed across all seed plants. And we saw that from the differences in the expression levels. But when you look at the sequence, at uh, these protein sequences, we're actually seen that the proteins are highly conserved. So uh, we suggest that the changes in that expression patterns, in those expression patterns, those shifts in the expression patterns are most likely due to changes in the regulatory sequences. So outside the coding sequence uh, of those proteins. Or it may also be due to major morphological differences between the species. And it turns out that even within angiosperms, uh, we see major morphological differences. So for instance, Arabidopsis, we have that the ovules develop uh, in angiosperms, the ovules develop in a region called placenta. And in Arabidopsis, the placenta develops from the inner side of the carpels. So the carpel is a here illustrated with this a light brown and the placenta with red. So the placenta develops in the inner region of those carpels. Whereas in other flowers, for instance, in petunia, that meristematic activity of the placenta is always active. So in Arabidopsis, it's not active here and it gets turned on later in carpel development. But in other flowers, it's always uh, active. So there are major uh, changes in the regulation of these genes, uh, particularly uh, that we know of in those genes that are involved since very early in ovule development, right? But we also saw that there are major morphological differences uh, among different species. So we see, we definitely need more studies in other gymnosperms, like conifers would be great. And, but we also need different types of genetic studies, like trying to understand if the interaction of these proteins is conserved or not across all seed plants. Uh, I also want to highlight that our expression patterns allowed us to uh, support or provide more evidence supporting the synangial hypothesis for the origin of the seed. And, as we saw, the seed is definitely a very diverse structure anatomically. So this is a representation of a different ovule anatomies. And we see that it's very diverse anatomically, but also morphologically. And here we have the evolutionary history of these um, of uh, seed plants, including fossil lineages, which are in, uh, with the gray lines. And it turns out that paleontologists have proposed multiple independent origins for the integument, so independent origins for the seed. So I definitely think that the homology of the seed and the 
structures associated with the seed is the discussion that we still need to be having. And it turns out that with the studies that we perform in, in these gymnosperms, we also identified several uh, and we, we saw differences in the genes that are expressed in these uh, structures. So this suggests also a possible uh, differences in the homology of these structures. So I want to highlight the importance of uh, working with several different species. So as uh, given this extraordinary diversity, it is very difficult to extrapolate what we know from one species to all the others. All right. Thank you very much for being here. And I hope we have time for questions. Yes, we totally do. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Uh, this talk was awesome. Uh, I'm just going to remind everybody that uh, uh, if you have questions, please write them in the chat, and I'll read them to Cecilia as they as they come out. Um, okay. Thank you, Cecilia. Uh, thank you. Uh, I I. Could you See I kind those lines? What happened? Oh yeah, we, we could see them. I'm not really sure. I've, I've seen this before. Uh, I, I think that like there's a button you can press to, to draw lines with PowerPoint, like in the middle of presentation. Maybe. I didn't realize they were going to stick around though. That was <laughs> surprising to me. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I didn't want to interrupt the flow of the, of the presentation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you have to, what, well, I can delete them? What, really? <laughs> no way <laughs> wow okay um yeah so while questions come on in here i wanted to ask a quick question myself um so uh, early on you you were talking about these uh these the duplicate genes that you were looking at the gene duplication events and uh and these are always really interesting to me uh um you know that they that some of them like maybe develop into pseudo genes and lose function and some of them like take on some other function uh but in any case they undergo like huge amounts of of like just drift away from their original uh like sequence really and i was curious when you presented the the data there i didn't really have a lot of time to to you know look at it i was curious if you could just touch on like how you differentiated the like the primary uh you know these primary uh the words are escaping me i'm sorry uh like the main gene the like the standardized the one that that everybody looks to for the the main function of that particular gene with with these these uh duplicates from the duplicates yeah so it's a little difficult because we're taking like a backwards approach. So because the mole species are Arabidopsis, we use that as a reference, mm -hmm. right? Because for many of these genes, all what we know is from Arabidopsis. We don't know anything in any other species. So it's a little yeah. difficult because we now are working with this like ginkgo, which is very, is not closely related to Arabidopsis. It's actually very far, right? So it's always based on Arabidopsis, so that's why I started looking for these genes, taking that sequence and finding that sequence across all seed plants. So uh, let's say that the referent is always Arabidopsis, which is not a great referent because it's very uh, distant. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that Brassicaceae, so the family where Arabidopsis belongs to, has undergone whole genome duplication events, multiple whole genome duplication events. So wow. this family has more sets of genes than any other species. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that definitely gets quite complicated. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for dipping into that a little bit. Uh, we do have yep. a question. Uh, we have a uh, great talk, two questions. Uh, number one, what is uh, the presumed function of the brats, dry or fleshy, in ephedra? Yes, uh, so, so the main function, there are several functions, and it's the same thing for all, like the seed code, the integument, and everything that protects that. Uh, 
one is a tolerance to desiccation protecting that a embryo for long periods of time, but also ensuring dispersion of the seeds. So gymnosperms don't have fruits like in tomatoes, so the tomato actually disperses the seed, the fruit disperses the seed. In this case, there are these extra structures that are in charge of the dispersion of the offspring. So in ephedra, uh, there are dry seeds, there may be dry or there may be dry and winged, or they may be fleshy. So there are different uh, types of dispersion. So those that are fleshy are um, dispersed by birds mostly. So they're linked with dispersion of the seed. Okay. The second part of this question is, did you say that the ovules of needum on uh, monoecious stroboli were not fertile? On monoecious, on monoecious stroboli, they vary. So when the pollen, uh, it's fertile, the ovule is not. But sometimes when the ovule is fertile, the pollen cones that are viable are farther away from that. So the pollen cones next to that a viable ovule are not functional, but the ones that are farther away, they are functional. So it's like a little bit to avoid uh, self-fertilization. Uh, That's a pretty interesting adaptation. Yes. <laughs> Uh, we have, by the way, a ton of like, you know, amazing, uh, you know, comments in here about your presentation and congratulations. It's an awesome presentation. Well done. It was a great presentation. Uh, um, that was beautiful. Congratulations, doctor. <laughs> All kinds of great uh, comments here in case you want to take a look at some point. Um, we have another one that says, uh, thank you. Can you please elaborate on uh, what is the paleontological evidence, if any, in support of the synangial uh, origin of the seed coat? Yes, so actually the telom origin, now uh, there is this combination between the telom origin hypothesis and the synangial hypothesis. So the telom origin hypothesis is completely based on fossil records. So the fossil record shows these uh, integumentary lobes with different degrees of fusion, right? And it turns out that if you follow the vascular bundles in those fossil lineages, you see that those may have been also sporangia at some point. So that's why we're now like combining these two hypotheses, and this is known now as a neo synangial hypothesis. So all the fossil record of those pre ovules may also support the synangial hypothesis because those telomes and those uh, integumentary lobes may have been fertile at some point. Wow. Uh, okay, another question here. Um, unicorn was expressed in the apical part of the ovule near micropyle and in the pollen grain. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there some potential signaling uh, involved in pollen tube cell germination? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> so it is interesting that the, it, it may be, I have no idea. <laughs> it may be, now that you've raised that point, it may be. It turns out that also we're seeing this many canary, it's also expressed in the apical region of the integument. So we're starting to see that many of these genes that are involved in the polarity, so in Arabidopsis is like making a flat integument, right? So the, the planar identity of the integument. But we're seeing that many of those genes are actually expressed only in the apical region of the integument in, in Ginkgo. So we're thinking that it's also involved in the orientation of the integument, but it's changing a little bit. And there is something that we may not be getting from, from the morphology still. So it's a, it's a little difficult. It's a complicated puzzle to put together, but no doubt. that's a very really good question. <laughs> um, I, I also had one more question for you. Uh, 
I was I was curious if if uh, there was any <clears throat> if there was any evidence or or information about like the possibility that uh, that some of these genes may be undergoing like some uh, like alternative gene splicing and things like that that could like complicate the the relationship between specific genes and their expression. Uh, yes, definitely. And we saw that in uh, the transcriptome. So we were able to identify several different isoforms of, of the same protein. So that is due to changes and small shifts in the, in the coding sequence. Uh, but in general, we saw that the proteins are highly conserved. So we still don't know what, what's going on there. So there are definitely copies that are, uh, have changes and that's why they, they have like so different expression patterns. Uh, but in general, the protein sequence is very, very conserved. Okay, mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Uh, we have another two questions. Um, uh, what is the homology morph uh, morphologically and from and from gene expression of the fleshy seed coat in Texas? Um, it's it's a different structure. So the seed uh, coat in Texas is an aerial. So it's a structure that develops from the funiculus, the, the stalk of the ovule. So it has a different anatomical and morphological origin compared to, let's say, the, the Bracts in ephedra that we saw. So it's, it's a different structure. Uh, we also sequenced taxos and uh, we saw, again, different genes that are involved in the development of the areole. Um, and the aril is something that has appeared multiple times across the evolution of seed plants, and we see it in many tropical plants like a passion fruits and, and those. So it would be really good to know if those genes that we identified from taxus are also involved in aril development in angiosperms. That, that's a good question. But it's, it's a different structure uh, in the homology. Okay. Uh, one more question. Uh, if no pollen grain uh, slash pollination occurs, uh, does the integument form normally? Um, so in gymnosperms, the integument development occurs, uh, like in ginkgo, uh, occurs even before fertilization. So we have integument formed and the integument becomes fleshy. The seed doesn't develop, of course, after if there is no fertilization, uh, the seed aborts. But the integument becomes fleshy in gymnosperms the same way. Uh, in angiosperms, the integument, the seed development is arrested. So it stops after, uh, until a fertilization occurs. So if there is no fertilization, there is no integument development, like integument to seed coat. The integument stays there. Okay. We have one more question. Uh, what's next? Oh my goodness, that's a really good question. Uh, I am actually uh, going to do a postdoc on seed development too in Italy which is really exciting. <laughs> That's awesome. Congratulations. Yeah. I'm so excited for you. <laughs> That's going to be so cool. Yes, yes. Some people I'm are saying congrats on the new that. position. <laughs> well, I think that pretty much wraps up the, uh, the Q&A session here. Uh, again, thank you so much, Cecilia, for, for giving uh, this talk to us. It was super interesting. And, People had some awesome questions. Thank you very much. Really good questions. I'm, I'm very thankful for being here. Thank you.